Do you see? Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, can everyone read that? Yes. <laughs> if Paul can, I think everybody. Can. Yeah, we should uh, turn off the light. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, where is the light? Uh, yeah. So, um, I'm going to talk about uh, algebraic data types, and it's going to be an introduction for very early beginners. Um, yeah, so uh, this is uh, the first uh, talk in a series of talks that we're going to try. Uh, called uh, 101s, so this is the ADT 101. Um, it's also an experiment because I'm going to do it with the working Haskell module and doc test. So this is a Vim session and I am able to run, uh, uh, to actually uh, load the file in, in a Haskell compiler and then run the doc tests. You can see here the, the hello world, this is how doc tests work. So uh, this is what you could enter in a, in a Haskell REPL. And then it checks that the output that it gets from a Haskell REPL is actually it looks like that. And here you can see that uh, the exclamation mark is missing. Can you see that on the right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I forgot the exclamation mark. Of course. Uh, if I add that in, then you will actually see that this works. So, yeah, so, but this is a bit uh, of an experiment. Um, to see whether, whether it works to give a talk with a module like this. Uh, I hope that the talk is going to be more interactive for that. So, yeah, if you have any questions or want to try out something, I can edit the code and then we can see what the compiler says and whether that works or not. So feel free to intercept. So, um, algebraic data types are very fundamental in Haskell. Um, they are much more fundamental than lots of other stuff that people talk about, like type classes or type class instances. Uh, they're much more fundamental than monads, for example, functors, monad transformers, or other related concepts like category theory. Yeah, I'm, I'm stop. I'm going to stop. But they're definitely not more fundamental than polymorphism. You can't claim that to this rate. Yeah. I mean, polymorphism comes into play even if you don't have ADPs at all, right? Yeah. A linear type system without ADPs as a least type, you can still have. Well, um, as I have a BIM session, I can delete that. We <laughs> 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 can defer that to discussion. Because it's a beginner's talk, right? Like, I mean, that's, that's not a discussion to have for in a one on one talk, I guess. Yeah, fine. <laughs> um, but I think it's, it's important to, to emphasize that, that uh, ADPs are very fundamental because it's very easy to get confused by the typical learning materials in Haskell that usually center around monads. Um, and monads are not uh, the thing that you should learn first. The first thing you should learn, learn first is uh, ADTs and maybe polymorphism uh, and, and you know, higher order functions and, and, and some of that. But uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about ADTs. Uh, the target audience, is, as I said, are absolute beginners. I do have the ambition that some intermediate Haskellers will gain some intuition for data types. But I'm not sure that I succeed. Let's see. So, um, the first concept that uh, I want to talk about are so-called product types. Uh, here you can see a very simple um, declaration of a product type that encodes a two-dimensional position. Um, and uh, what happens here is that um, you de declare two things. Um, one thing is a type that is called position, which is uh, indicated by the word uh, after data. And the second thing is a constructor, which is also called position. Uh, it's not a problem that they have the same name. They don't have to, but, but it's not a problem that they have. And it's, it's common that they do. Um, and a product type is a Cartesian product of its fields. So this product uh, type has two fields, both int, one is the x uh, uh, component and the other one is the y component. And uh, with that you can construct values of the type position using the constructor position. Uh, and you just stick two values in there that are both of type int. 
and then you get a value of type position. You can see that uh, here. So this time you can say, well, I want to have a position where the first field is three and the second field is five, and then you get that. Right? You can also do a bit more complicated stuff. You can say that the x component is some calculation, right? Um, and then this will actually evaluate to this. Does that make sense so far? Um, I think, I think okay. it's, uh, Victoria is not here yet, you know, here, so neither Yang is, so maybe you will ask the beginners. <laughs> Does it make sense? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, <laughs> Alisa? So, um, I, th I think it's, um, I mean, the term constructor is also used in, in OOP, for example, and in, in, in Haskell it works quite differently. And Haskell constructor is really something like a, like like something that doesn't do anything. You just stick values in it, and then it contains these values. Sometimes I also think of a constructor as as a as a name tuple, right? Like it's it's just a tuple of two two numbers, and it has this tag position and it has this type position, um, but it's it's it cannot do anything else. Is it just that. like structure and like normal like C or yes. It's like a struct in C, exactly. It's just a position. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah, it's atomic. You cannot, you cannot split it up anymore, right? Construct is just uh, like can, can, cannot be looked at, cannot be inspected further. Um, and one interesting thing is that if you have a value of type position, it has to be constructed with the position constructor. There's no other way to construct a value of, of type position. Uh, at some point, it's, it's going to be a uh, position constructor. Of course, you can have a function like this one, make position, that takes an int and then just creates a position for you, which in this case, well, for example, if you give it a 4, it will just set both components to 4. But somewhere uh, uh, at the lowest layer, it's, it is going to use the position constructor. Um, one thing that I haven't, uh, that is something that, that people don't talk about that often, I guess, but that I found very useful is something called implicit signatures, which is, um, so, so if you define a data type like position, you do get implicit things, and of course talk about the constructor, um, and these implicit things do have types, and it's, uh, for example, in our example, uh, this is how you ask uh, the Haskell compiler for a type of something. So here I'm asking, what is the type of the constructor position? And then it tells me position is a function that takes two ints and produces a position. Right? Like, um, if we look at the, at the position data type, it's not completely apparent that that's what we get. But it makes a lot of sense when you think about um, the constructor as something that you stick the values in, and then you get the value, right? So, so I think it's often useful, especially when, when you start thinking about these things, to, to bring these implicit types to your mind. Um, Does mean that you will present partially applied constructors? Sorry, what? You will show partially applied constructors? No, I won't show anything partially applied. <laughs> um, uh, another thing that you can do, um, which is slightly is, gives you a bit more uh, power for, for product types, are selectors. So you can uh, define, this is a very similar type, right? Um, but you can, at the type declaration, also give the fields names. So this says the first field is called pos x, and the second field is called, called pos y. And that uh, gives you actually a function, pos y, well, two functions, but one, one is pos y, that actually yeah, does what, what we expect to, to do. It, it extracts the one field. It's like key for a hash run. Like Sorry. when you extract a value by key in, in map or hash run, so strike uh, Yeah, a, a bit like. like it's, it's very rude, for example. Well, but it's type, uh, it's a field of a structure. But it's typed. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's more yeah, of course, right. more similar to, to a, that, yeah. can you show the type of Poswell? Right, no. Yes, 
Again, uh, uh, POS1 and POSX do get uh, um, implicit signatures. So you, what you do get is a function, POSX, that has the type position 2 to int. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. And then there's no special syntax for accessing that field. You just get this function. But it's yeah, it's more similar to like a like a dot um, accessing of yeah. of, uh, of structs or something. But I still think it's and so far a good comparison as that commonly in Haskell programs you see rarely the use of hash map or yes or tree map, and in other languages you see them a lot. And basically, we replace them by by this records. Yeah, I think it's useful, especially as a Haskell programmer that you. Most of the time, you think you want to have a hash map. You don't want a hash map. You want, want this one. Yeah. yeah that's, that's a because it is that yes string. Yeah. I mean, you, the only the only reason you would annotate a hash map is if you don't know your your domain basically, right? Yeah. So your domain is yeah. open. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 There's no like uh, any key value type for this. Uh, yeah, you, you you can put new keys in there. Yeah, right. I mean, it's it's just like the the question was that like it's is it some like an annotate or graph example? Yeah, yeah. How yeah. To understand it like if you're coming from like imperative kind of issue. Yeah. No, no, but even in imperative settings, right? If you have a non-unitype language, then it makes perfect sense to have fields, type fields, right, which is very different, which, which are static, which is very different from a runtime domain for it's some associated data structure. It's very, like, uh, sort of language-specific, right, because, like, for some languages you may have type variables, for some you may not have, like, for example, for Ruby you may have, like, type variable, just like this thing with, uh, like, value variable. Right, no, 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 but what I mean is, like, unless your language is unified, like Ruby, like, in, in Ruby it doesn't really make much of a difference because you, you don't have types, static types anyway, so this yeah, whole yeah. distinction, but, but, but in, like, C++, which is, or C even, right, which yeah. is imperative, but it still makes sense to have a struct with a static set of fields yeah, with, yeah, yeah. with static types. Yeah. But even in C, that doesn't mean that you don't need associated data structures like a hash map, right? Because it's a completely different thing for some yeah. kind of problem where you know you, you process something yeah. Yeah. to find yeah. out what the keys are, then you're gonna need a hash map. Yeah. Even though or, or not a hash map, but some associated data yeah. structure. Even though in C you have records with static fields. Yeah. So this is more like the C record fields and but does, it, does this mean, talking about the C struct field names, right. you're implicitly littering your namespace yes. with all of the fields? Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's like a word of Haskell. Yeah, it's really yeah. bad. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah, what you what you actually do do get is is this function pos y and pos x these two functions into your scope, and yeah. So you couldn't have another type with the same field names, for example. Yeah. I would have loved to name these X and Y, but I use X and Y somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> so on the other hand, the, on the line 95, what is this to write into your... Uh, please ignore that for now. <laughs> <laughs> That's why. <laughs> that uh, has no, little to do with algebraic data times. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but the, yeah, does, does that make sense? Any, any other questions? So, um, what, what so far what we have done is only construct values, right? We, uh, positions. Um, what we also want to be able to do is deconstruct uh, values because we want to do something with that. And here's a small example that um, figures out whether a position is valid. I'm talking about uh, chess, by the way, if anyone's wondering <laughs> what the domain of this is. Um, why, why are positions with integers and not doubles? But yeah. Um, so what you can see here is that um, this is a function of type position to bool, and the deconstruction happens here. It's called pattern matching. So what, what happens here is that we say, well, our, our input uh, argument is, is of type position, and then we can use the constructor to actually uh, uh, 
deconstruct the position value and get the x and the y. So what will happen is that the actual two, two fields will be bound to x and y. These are, are um, uh, arguments, uh, parameters to the function now. Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah, so, the, yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, is valid um, behaves as we expect it to behave. Uh, those are product types. And now, um, the other fundamental concept uh, with ADTs are sum types. Um, and I have a very simple sum type here that is um, for color. Again, this is about chess, right? So, um, what we have here are two uh, distinct constructors that are alternatives. So uh, the type of this uh, is, is color. We declare a new type that's called color. And it has two constructors, uh, white and black. And um, if, I, if I write down the white constructor, I get a white constructor of type color. And if I write down black, I get the black value of type color. Um, Again, we have some implicit signatures that are much simpler now, so white, yeah, I just said that. Uh, white is a type of color and so on. Um, again, interesting is that in some types, uh, if you have a value of a certain type, you know that one of the constructors is being used to construct that value. Right? So if you have a, have a value of type color, you know it's either white or black, no matter how, it's going to be, uh, how it was constructed. Um, and deconstruction of some types uh, works like this. So, for example, here's a very simple function that just figures out whether a color is black or not. Um, and here there's a case statement where you say, um, if my given color, and then you again you pattern match on the two constructors. You say, if it's black, then you return true, and if it's white, then you, can, uh, you, you, you evaluate to false. Yeah. And then, uh, I have no test case for blank. Does, does that make sense? No? Um, and, and, and these are the two concepts that you use in Haskell to construct all your data types that you, that you have. So um, every data type is a list of constructors, and every constructor uh, has a list of fields. Right? So, for example, here uh, I have a data type for a chess piece, and it can either be a pawn, and a pawn has two fields, a position and a color. Or it can be a rook, and that again also has a position and a color. So e every data type is uh, a sum of products, if you want. Um, but then you can declare as many data types as you want, and then you can stick them together. So that that's actually how you can build quite complex structures. So, for example, I have declared position myself, and position is a two-dimensional position of, of, of ints, and I have declared color myself, and that can be black and white, and then I can use those to declare a piece, uh, which then is, is quite a rich data structure and quite, quite nicely models what, what a chess piece is. Right? Um, I included queen here just to show that these don't have to have the same number of fields at all, right? Like that's not, not a restriction. Um, if you wanted to, then, then you can do that, but you don't have to. Uh, if there are any avid chess players here, then please don't. <laughs> the logic to choose. <laughs> yeah, and, and again, we have implicit signatures, right? And I, I think it's useful to look at them. So, so for example, the pawn, um, constructor has the type position to color to piece, right? You give it a position and you give it a color and you get a piece. The information that it's a pawn and not a knight is encoded in the constructor. Okay. Uh, rook has the same type and queen has a different type because it gets this, this queen origin. It has this additional field. Uh, yes. Yeah, we can of course uh, then construct, use these constructors to construct something here. I construct a rook on one one. That's actually the, the correct position. Sorry, what yes. happens? So, so given that you've got this littering problem, you, you now use the words original and creative, which are kind of useful words, right? 
Which I can't use for what? Which I use for words, which yes. I want to use for other things. So, what, so the, you've implicitly created POSX above. What happens if you say is original or POSX? What kind of error do you get? Well, if. Um, let's try to reproduce it. So, uh, for example, if. Created with POSX instead. Well, I mean, this is not useful at all, but if I did this. Then I would get this error message. Multiple declarations of position. Because it sees that as reading. Well, you, th that doesn't work in Haskell, right? Like in Haskell, a declaration is, is a declaration and it's valid for, for all eternity. And, and that's why this won't compile because it says, like, well, you, just, you have two declarations for position, so which, which one should I take? Right. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, this, this is a practical problem. Um, uh, you can put it in different modules and then, you know, uh, um, figure it out through, through qualified names. Um, but yeah, this, this is actually a problem in practice sometimes. Um, yeah, here's, here's an example of a deconstruction of this more complicated type uh, called P's, where we first have a case statement on the piece. So, so the idea is that, that this function returns all allowed positions, assuming that there's nothing standing in the way. Um, so what we do first here in, in, in the first case statement is that we pattern match on the piece, and we say, like, well, if this is a pawn, and then on, you can, you can then recursively uh, uh, pattern match on the fields also, right? Like you can, the first field is a position and you can pattern match on that as well and, and directly get the x and the y. And in this case, we also need the color because pawns, uh, white pawns uh, can move differently than, than black pawns. And then we do a second um, pattern match on the color and we say, well, if it's white, then we allow this uh, movement and if it's black, then we allow this one. Again, this is not about chess. <laughs> um, yeah, but what, what I find interesting is that if you look at this, this piece of code, then, then almost everything you do is concerned with deconstructing and, and constructing data structures, right? It's almost nothing else. And that's actually what, what Haskell is ideally about, that, that you design your data types so nicely that, that uh, coding becomes very, very... Uh, you say like like everything falls into place just because you have to construct something of that of that type. Unambiguous. Unambiguous. Yes. Yeah. I have a question on yes. line one nine two, the error um, case. Yes. Is that the error on one eighty eight and it returns you a type position error there? No, it's a string. Um, that's a very good question. I, I, uh, can you repeat the question? Oh, the error case and it returns this NYI string. Yeah. But you're returning in your function signature a type position array. Yeah, this is actually uh, lazy. I, I didn't want to program it all out. So um, this is where actually you throw an exception. Oh. Yeah, and then you don't actually, get a list but of that positions. Works. I mean, even though your function doesn't match your function signature. Yeah, it's 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 much like in, in other languages where where oh, we just throw you know you just throw an exception oh, and then right, you, yeah. you chicken right. out right. Like, right. <laughs> so um, we but precise if you throw an exception. You can do it anywhere, and it can have any type. Yeah, so that's just exiting, basically. Yeah, and then it, if you run into this into this case, then it will just basically tell you, like, oh, something wrong happened, and why I... Uh, yeah. Can you show the type of error? Uh, yes. So that's why it matches. It's purely polymorphic in the output type. So what that means is that for any choice of A, you can there. Yeah. So it's cheap. Yeah. <laughs> And so, but what, what's well, interesting? Then. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Gerber, do, do you want to to, to give a one on one on polymorphism? But you don't want to argue that error is more important than data types, right? Of course, it is because. <laughs> everything in Haskell is over these uh, domains instead of sets, exactly because you have pattern and non-termination. 
right? You can define error without any reference to the ADT. It's error s equals error s. And then you have a button, and you can't get rid of it in a very complete language. So. Yeah. Yeah. I was just talking <laughs> out of my ass, and I said it, it's more fundamental. Yeah. So, um, but, but what, what is interesting about the error case is that I had to add it to get rid of this error message, uh, this, this warning. So, if now I deleted the error case, and then because you have these types with these constructors, um, the, the compiler actually has a lot of information about the structure of, your, of the values, and then it can tell you, well, you didn't tell me what to do in case of, of a rook and a knight and a queen, right? You did tell me what to do in case of a pawn, but, but before you declare that this, this can be different stuff, um, and then uh, I didn't want this warning, and then I added this case. Yeah. So if you did declare for the other three types, you wouldn't need the error case? Yes, exactly. Yeah. So do you always have to um, put in cases for every case? Do you have to match every case? You, you don't have to, right? This is a warning. Um, oh, it's a warning. But, but of course, um, you, you should take that warning seriously because it, it tells you that, you know, the type checker can't guarantee that you won't get a value of that with that constructor, right? Okay. So what happens if there's no error and you call for it with the broke? So, uh, it, it, it also throws an exception that is more general that says, like, oh, I, there's an unmatched pattern and I don't know what to do. Actually, more useful exception than just many cases. Yeah, more useful than the NYI, of course. I, I really just added that to get rid of the warning, right? I mean, we, we, we can try that out, right? We can just... Um, uh, here we have a test case for the pawn, which kind of works. Um, but we can, of course, put the rook here and then um, it will give us this exception. Differently, yeah. Then I will remove the arrow, right? Yeah, so this now is not a compile, oh no, sorry, the, the first one is the compile time warning, and then down here we see uh, exception, and it's cut off. <laughs> <laughs> there, you can see it. So it gives you actually a source location with the, with the file name uh, and, and the columns of the, the lines, and non-exhaustive pattern case, which of course is much more useful than NYI. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's already it. That, that, that's already the things that I that I really wanted to talk about. There are lots of uh, random thoughts that I have here that, that if we still have time, we can go through some of them. But uh, so far, thanks for this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's it. So, anybody is interested in, in listening more about SOPs? Uh, yeah. So, it's quarter past nine, I don't know. Anybody is half past two? We, we have pizza. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks to lanterns. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah. We're not hiring hassle programmers. Yeah. <laughs> I have a little question. Yes. Syntax and laying out Haskell code. Do you usually do a function signature and then the implementation of the function of one or the other? Usually you do, you don't have to, but that looks right. Right, but so it, would it be an error if you did implementation, say, at one, line 188, because another implementation of allow boobs, would that be an error, or can you? Um, <laughs> there, there's a weird syntax, uh, I, I think it's a bit weird, um, uh, where you say, where you say actually something like this, um, for example, what you could do is say, um, uh, this, and then you have the next case here, right? Uh, which, which looks like two, two definitions, but it's not. It's like, it's, it's one definition of a lot of moves. It, it's just a weird it's way of. Functional in this case. 
What? It's you like function overloading with different. No, it's not overloading. It's, it's, it's the same function. Yeah, that's that, that's why it's so confusing. That's why I, why I wrote why I wrote it down with case because then you can see it's one function, right? Th this is this is just uh, two lines. Like th this this actually is is uh, semantically equivalent to the to the case statement where you have one declaration and then a case statement. Because in this case, if you call allow boot with a rook, it would fall in the line 192, but if you had a pawn, it would fall in 188, and if you had a queen, it would still fall in 188. Yeah, it would behave exactly the same way. Okay. And you know, for, no, it wouldn't fall into the queen, but it would fall in 192. Oh. Oh, the queen, oh, the queen, queen would fall in oh. fall through, and then we get put in there. You get oh, the same no, pattern, pattern sorry, match yeah. failing, failing error as, as you get with the case. So, which one, so if it was queen, you would fall in. If if if, if, it, if, if you pass it a queen, yeah. then none of the patterns will match, oh, yeah. and then it will throw an exception telling right. you like missing. Oh, yeah. missing the same syntax. They're always doing these unmatched equations. Yeah, yes. 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 So you can. Right. 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 Okay. Yeah. And and what what maybe maybe uh, gives some more intuition for this like if you do this for example, um, then this is not allowed because then it would complain about multiple declarations of allowed moves, right? Um, yeah. This is the same like like if you if you have it like this, this is the same function. It's not overloaded uh, or anything. Is like synthetic sugar maybe? Yes, yeah, it's, it's you could you could very well argue that it's this is syntactic sugar for case. Yeah. I mean, I think the reason why we have that is um, that it just allows you to define functions like in a math book, or if you write a paper, then you may want to write it like that. But for practical Haskell, yeah. people use that, but it's not essential. And I think it could be easily if it's only about practical program, it could be easily from my perspective. Eliminated from language. Okay. Yeah. So I should so I should instead of using the keys instead of multiple. I uh, people use that syntax, but I don't because um, <laughs> if I refactor the things, the case is easier to deal with. Basically. People depending. Sometimes it looks nicer when it's the case, and then you may also do, use eliminate the nested case here because you can put the white in the first equation and the second equation repeats the same but with black in, in place of color yeah you could you could uh, do this right and then you needed a neck uh, another case where you say yeah, black <laughs> Does it make sense that this is yeah. the same thing? Yeah. yeah. This is because there is a lot of pattern matching or cases matching in Haskell. So people do shortcuts to make it nice. Yeah. Any other questions? I imagine this is this this, this way is easier if you just want to care about one case. Then you don't have to write, you don't, you don't have to write keys off. You can just add match this and then everything else. Yes, exactly. If you have a function uh, th that we have seen uh, uh, further up, right? Uh, if you have a function like this, you wouldn't want to write uh, is valid p equals case p of yeah. position x, y, arrow, and then you just have one right hand side. Right? I guess Simon also uses that in this case. Yeah, of course, in this case, yes. <laughs> yes I have to do. No, I don't, don't do it partially defined functions. If you look at a more complicated example further down, the problem is if you change anything, right, and you don't have a case statement, you need to. You may end up changing it, changing it on multiple lines. If you add a function argument, for example, you need to add it four times. If you have the case statement, you just add it only one time. Yeah, right. So this is what I mean with refactoring. But, I mean, if this is for beginners, I would like to stress that you should strive for total functions every time. So if you have a sum type and you write a function over it, then 
you should be able to provide a right-hand side for every possible left-hand side of your subtype. If you can't, like if you have a function where you have a one of the possible patterns is something that you can't meaningfully write the right-hand side, you should regard that very strongly as a code smell, that maybe the type you're using is not the right one, maybe you're not modeling some of your assumptions on the type level, because, yeah, because, it, because uh, you know, Haskell is not a total language in itself. You can write partial functions, but it's only going to cause problems further down, because you will end up you know, using that function somewhere deep down in some other code, and you have no idea if the thing you pass to it is going to be one of the things that is not handled by your partial function. Like the, in some sense, this is all. This, this is what static uh, typing is all about. And if you have the right type, then this is the class of problems that you should be able to avoid completely. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Um, so, so one some of the random thoughts that I wrote down is this, uh, one of them was that I think when you when you design a data type for a given domain and, and you code something with that, then you do have to to try around a bit to get it right, right? There's often like a first first draft, and then then one thing that you, that can happen is that you run into a function where you write something and then you realize you don't know what to do with one of the cases, and that's exactly what you were talking about. And then and then the, the compiler errors, uh, the, the warnings really help you, and then you rethink: can I can I change the design of my types so, such that uh, uh, I can I can get rid of this case for this one function? And then you have to switch it around a bit. Uh, yeah. So, so the, yeah, the goal is that, that when you design a, uh, a type or, or, or a bunch of types, that they model the d domain that you have as closely as possible, and that they, I mean, of course, you, you have to allow to encode everything that you need to encode, but you should try to disallow as much invalid things that that uh, that shouldn't shouldn't happen. So like an overly simplistic example would be that don't use an int if you're modeling a chessboard because you know it's yes. only going to have one of eight possible values, right? The int type is much larger than just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Yes. So. Yeah. yeah. What I also, I mean, it's, it, maybe it's not really Haskell specific, but what I also really find important is that you shouldn't model anything <coughs> that you don't need. Right? I mean, we, we have talked mostly about data types and we haven't done that much with them, so that's why we do have a lot of things that we don't really use. But in, in, that, that happens in practice too, right? Like that someone tells you to write a chess program and then you say like, yeah, that's, that's good and we have pawns and rooks and board and pieces. And then in the end what they want you to do is, is uh, for example, output chess quotes every day. <laughs> right? And then you realize, well, that's we don't need any of, 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 of the, the data model that, that we build. So sometimes it feels weird what you can leave out, right? So for example, um, I, I, I would guess that in, in, in this uh, data type, we could leave out the color of the rook. If all we want to do is, is uh, compute the, the allowed movements, and we don't need to know whether that's black or white, yeah, you do. If you want to capture. If you want to capture. Yeah. You want to capture? Well, yeah, no, the, the allowed <laughs> movement is just like, imagine the one rook on a yeah. so chessboard and you just... So it's a very friendly yeah. chessboard. What? It's a very friendly chessboard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, well, I mean, that's, that's what the allowed move function. So, like, it doesn't even get to take the mm. board into account, right? Like, it just computes the, the list of positions that you can go to. And for that, we don't need the color. We, know, we do need the color for the pawn because that can move in different directions, right? But, but so, so what I usually do is when I start designing such a data type is, is, is what I would actually do is start with something like this, which defines a data type that doesn't have any constructors. It's called an uninhabited type. It doesn't have any values. You can construct a value of that. But I'm thinking, like, well, as long as I don't know what I want to do with that and what information I would want to put in there, I just, I just don't put any constructor in there. 
And then at some point I need something to put in there and then, then I say, well, maybe this. It doesn't contain any information, right? It, it's just like there's only one value that this type can ever take, which is peace. But as long as I don't do anything with it, I don't put anything inside. Just, just uh, uh, to avo uh, avoid the risk that I put something inside that I don't, that I end up not using. Because and I wrote it down here. Uh, unused constructors and unused fields are dead code too. Like we usually think of dead code for, of, of, of like things that does uh, code that does something. But a field that we don't use is, 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 is uh, equally harmful. Yeah. Uh, I wonder if there are some data model repositories. So sometimes you don't want to waste your time modeling the data 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 dom the domain. Uh, so in Haskell, maybe there, there is, for example, like e-commerce, aerospace, or different data models already created in Haskell that you could reuse it simply. Um, well, th there are lots of libraries that define data types, right? Um, for certain domains, but usually they are quite generic. Um, well, not always, but um, so. So, for example, um, you could you could have a library that helps you interact with uh, the Amazon API, and then you would have, have all kinds of data types that that allow you to to specify the information that you want to send to Amazon, and, uh, and, and then you get. Uh, another data type back, another value of a, of a certain data type back, and then you have, then a library would provide these data types that model the inputs and outputs of this of this service. Mm -hmm. Does so it you need to go to the library? There is no like special repository with only data models that people maintain your know, standardized or something uh, only in Haskell. Yes, yeah. only in Haskell. Like, I, I I also don't know if, if most could translate data types to any other other system of ontologies that, that would somehow match exactly what, what has the data types can do. Maybe, but, but I, I don't know of any, any systems. So, so usually a library is, is like a mix of functions uh, and maybe constants uh, and uh, data types for your domain. Because the, the operations that you want to perform on these data types also limit the domain that you want to accept here. Well, and also in Haskell, constructors are, are not really expressive enough to, to be useful enough on their own, right? If all you have is an ADT with no functions over it, that's not, that's not providing much. Right? It's, not like, it's not like you have a rich language of what it means something to be constructor. Right. It's only a business dictionary which you could use, 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 not spend the time to model it. But yes, uh, yeah, but, but, yeah but, but if you don't know what you want to do with it, right. uh, so either you have some functionality in mind, in which case you will have the function next to the ADP, or if you don't, then it's not providing much value to have just the ADP, because like I said, the, the the language of constructor is not rich enough to encode anything non-trivial. Yeah. I mean, if you, if you look at it from the the Curry Howard lens. But I mean, we have a library uh, that yeah. Um, yeah. It's defines only HTTP uh, types yeah. for HTTP. HTTP types. We have a library that defines types for HTTP, mostly only types. I mean. There are some tools that that actually look at some, for example, Michal wrote a tool that looks at, at JSON and then generates Haskell code that is that is the data types for for whatever the J, however the JSON looks like. Um, but then as, as as you said, you still have to write a function to do something with that, right? Like just the pure data type definition uh, it, it is, is, is is useful but but uh, not a program or and, and, and in practice, that is a very uncommon uh, case. Like most of the times, we will write their their data types by hand. Yeah. So in like in Java or in other other environments, you have you some data models for per industry. They are standardized and so on. So 
uh, yeah, it's, sometimes it's use, useful, but yeah, you need you need to have some default logic as, as you said. As you said, so uh, yeah, I was only interested if you have something to use in the Haskell. So yeah, thanks. I mean, of course, so we do have something like libraries of like data structures and that kind of stuff. But again, together with the operations, if, in Java, if you get a class, then you're getting by definition and some method. Right, so, so in, in Haskell, that would be getting some type yeah, definition plus some functions over the mm -hmm. uh, Yeah, but in Java, you don't need to have the methods as well. You want, you want some abstraction to talk with the business users, analysts, mm -hmm. and, so, and so on. So you don't want to waste the time to analyze the business domain mm -hmm. because some business domains, I don't know, e-commerce, banking, they are quite standardized. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just wondering, is there a notion of uh, extension of existing, say, existing some type with uh, more cases? Not in the simple algebraic data types. No. For this, you need to to capture the demand that, that seems to be here at some point. His name is Lawrence, and he has been working on data types a la carte, and constructing data types together on making sure that your functions work for this data type and the other data types that are kind of derived mm. from it. Okay. But yeah. if he's not here, I will, I will not repeat his lecture because it's quite, quite meaty and quite long. But the, the technical term is closed. Mm. The, the, the data types are closed. You cannot, after the fact, add anything. I mean, when you think about it, you have to also add the new alternative every function. No, it'd be a new type, right? With the same case, same, uh, you know, some cases, but maybe you have more cases. Oh, but if it's a new type, then you can easily create a new type for one of the alternate, not one of the, like it's a, it would be a sum of product types where the first alternative just embeds this existing type, the second one is your first new constructor, the third oh, one is your second new that's constructor. True. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so I, I also wrote down something uh, here, combinatorics, like, like w when you have this, this, this uh, sum of products, you can think about what is possible with, with, uh, uh, with this system. Um, so what, what, what you could have is, is a wrapper type that is just one constructor and one field, right? It cannot possibly have more information than, this, than the, the type that the, the field has. But it's a different type, so the compiler can tell the difference statically. Uh, and then, yeah, of course, you, you could add uh, another constructor to say, like, well, sometimes I, I don't have this value, I have something else. But then you cannot use the same selectors, right? You have to always unwrap what you have wrapped. Mm -hmm. and that's usually intentional because you want, if you wrap something, you mean that maybe it has some special meaning to it. Like, not just every process ID, just process ID that I produced in my program, for example. Or not just every socket, just HTTP socket. So the information underneath is the same, but the way you use it is different. Maybe you could also talk about your time before the wrap. Um, I, I don't think it's That's such a, an important concept. Like, uh, as it's not your performance. Yeah. So, so these these wrapper types. Uh, what I'm thinking of is something like this, right? Or, or maybe we use something like minute. Um, right. Like what, what this tells you is that it, it, there there are not more minute values of the, the, than there are int values, but it tells the compiler and, and the, the programmer that this is a minute mm -hmm. and not some something. And then you can always use new type, uh, which changes, uh, I think, rather irrelevant things. Um. So basically, new type means that it has to be a wrapper type. Yeah. So it is also strict. Yeah, it is strict, and you know where yeah, But so so you can use a new type when whenever you have one constructor and one field, and then it's slightly um, faster and it's strict. <laughs> What I also find interesting are uh, enumeration types, right? So what you could do is, um, 
you have certain flags for something, and then you can have, um, you know, what I, I think in Java they have enumeration types, and in, in C you would you would then use enum, um, um, and in Haskell you can just simulate that by by a sum type where every constructor has no fields, right, and then. One thing that might be uh, interesting is why is it named uh, some types and product types? So the names come from, I mean, with the product type, of course, there's the, the, the term Cartesian product, but, but what I'm always thinking is that um, if you think about how many possible values a type has, then in a product type, for example, if you have, um, if you have a product type, like of color and color. Uh, yeah, like this. Uh, well, then, then let's start with color, right? So, so this is a sum type. And um, every constructor has only one value, right? Like white, white can be one, one value and black can be one value. And the, the number of possible values for color is the sum of these things. Right? There's two possible values. If we had another constructor, then we had we would have to add that. Right? Um, and if we have a product type that takes two colors, then the number of possible values of, of that uh, constructor is actually the product of the, the possible values of all fields. So in this case, it would be uh, four. Does that make sense? Yeah. I think uh, if there are no further questions, we should call it. So, again, I encourage people to.